<sighs> the comfort of your favorite seat is now your comfy car selling command center, thanks to Carvana. It doesn't get any better than this. Your favorite seat's the best spot in the house. Make it even better by entering your license plate or VIN and getting a real offer in minutes. There really is no place like home. And speaking of home, Carvana will pick up your car from yours after you finalize your offer. Visit Carvana.com or download the app and sell your car from your comfy place. Man, that sunset is gorgeous. Grill, patio, sunset, hard to get better than that. Unless you're browsing Carvana's inventory while you soak it all in. Oh, burger time. So sit back, get comfortable. Carvana's got thousands of cars under $20,000 just waiting for you. I could stay here forever. Carvana, where car buying meets comfort meets convenience. Download the app or visit Carvana.com today. <laughs> Welcome to The Price of Football, the show that looks at the money behind the beautiful game with me, Kevin Day, and Liverpool University's Kieran Maguire. We're recording this on Wednesday, Kieran, for broadcast or dropping or whatever it is on Thursday. But um, regular listeners will recognise that I still have a smile on my face after Sunday. For once, Kieran, it is a beautiful game. Uh, and you were actually there. You were at the beautiful game, weren't you? You, you had my ticket. <laughs> I did indeed, uh, yes. Uh, so it was a it was a it was a fun packed football weekend. No, well, well the, the Burnley versus Brighton game was dreadful. Um, apart from the two comedy goals, uh, your boys did well. You know, fair, fair play to you, and you know, yes, you, you should be given credit. Uh, you because know, they they it, it wasn't a case of one chance to score. You know, but yeah, there was that clearance off the line. Uh, Maheta should have scored in in the second half as well. Uh, yeah. Liverpool with a few chances. Yeah, good game of football. Yeah, the trouble is now, Kieran, I'm in a situation which I can't quite deal with, which is I'm actually looking forward to our next game, which is it's not a state of mind I'm comfortable with, to be perfectly honest. And there were all these people uh, messaging me saying, well, Opta say there's no percent chance of you going down. And then, well, Opta need to look at the league table then. Uh, you'll finish 12th. You always do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why we bother. We might as well just start. This. There's a lot of clubs just say, well, we do eighth. Yeah, all right then. Fine. Um, it's Newsday, Kieran. There's a lot of news. There's some news. It, the Everton 777 finance story, Kieran, you're going to have to explain to me very slowly because it's it's starting to unravel. Um, and let's start with points deduction news elsewhere. First of all, Leicester City. Yes. Um, this could have been a points deduction, but it's not going to be a points deduction. Um, in the opinion of the Premier League... Um, and it's not gone to a commission yet. Leicester have breached the uh, PSR limit for the three seasons ended uh, 22-23. And of course, Leicester were a Premier League club. Um, and there then seems to have been a bit of correspondence between the Premier League and the EFL along the lines of, if you give Leicester a points deduction, we will apply it in the EFL. And I think it's fair to say that provoked quite a furious reaction from Leicester themselves. Because historically, you know, I always thought there was some form of, um, you know, not necessarily, some sort of agreement that they, the Premier League were willing to apply fines um, for EFL clubs that have done a breach. And they would deduct those fines in the Premier League, but they weren't prepared to do points deductions. And, and, and that, does make sense in my view because three points. Well, we, saw, we saw that we saw that with QPR, didn't we? Not well, that long the, ago. Yeah, there, there was that was what twenty eighteen, um, yeah. and ironically, Leicester themselves had a uh, had a fine imposed by the by the EFL, which the money was taken away from Leicester's Premier League uh, broadcast money. The same happened to Bournemouth. The same happened to Fulham uh, in the years that they were promoted. So there is a history of that. But if you think about it, in, in the Premier League, it's 38 games, 114 points. In the in, in the Championship, it's 46 games, which is 138 points. So three points in the Championship is not the same as three points um, in, the, uh, in the Premier League on a percentage basis. Um, so that's why there's always historically not been a carryover of points deductions. Um, you know, we, we know our, our good friend Nick DeMarco was, was acting on behalf of Leicester and... 
Um, I think Le Leicester were uh, pretty strong in their views that they were going to try to get some form of injunction against uh, the the attempts to in, to impose anything this season. But it, it subsequently turns out, and the EFL has admitted this, that even if the Premier League had had a commission this season and that had resulted in a points deduction, uh, the EFL says, we, we have, we've got no rights. We've got no, we've got no power to impose a points deduction. So that's where we are as far as this season is concerned. And the top of the championship, because Leicester, Leeds, Sandips, which have all been dropping points in in recent weeks, and Southampton have been, you know, knocking them back. You know, they've been they, they've been on fire. Um, it's going to be a fascinating finish to the season because. I think Leicester have still got to play Southampton. Leeds have still got to play Southampton. It's going to look to be a, a you know, a real uh, great end of the season. And we've said on many occasions, yeah, Championship financially it's a clown clown car, but from a footballing point of view, from an excitement point of view, I think it's amazing division to be in. Um, so that's where we are. I think the downside from Leicester's point of view is that the probability of a commission being formed over the course of the summer is likely to be quite high. Now, whether that is formed by the EFL or by the Premier League, we will have to wait to, to find out. Um, and therefore, if found guilty, and you know, as we always say, innocent until found guilty, we're a great believer in habeas corpus, um, then there's a fair chance that they would start the 24-25 season on negative points, which is, you know, not, not what you want. Uh, the QPR thing wasn't 2018, was it? I've been drinking way too much of it. It was, it was for when they were promoted in 2014. Right, yeah. Um, and, then, and it took oh, it four took years. To... It, it took Bloody four hell. years to reach a judgment because I remember I, I was in Canada at the time, uh, and somebody had leaked the judgment to me. So, me being me, I thought, oh, well, I'll stick it up on social media. Um, <laughs> and, and that was the first time I ever got in uh, ever got contact with, with Nick DeMarco. He says, it's, it's, not, it's not in the public domain. I don't think you should be there. I'll take it. I think you, you know, any chance of taking it down. And yeah, yeah Nick always seemed a good guy. So, um, that was that, how my first ever contact with the great man himself. Yeah, I, I always think when uh, when one of the most powerful lawyers in the land gets in touch and says you might like to take that down, you probably best to take that advice rather than listening to me going, "Hey, it'd be fine. I can't see what the issue is. Leave it there. But not a problem." Um, <laughs> more points deduction news. Um, as expected, Kieran Everton and Nottingham Forest have appealed against their points deductions. You can understand why, given the increasing tightness of the relegation race down there get me after three points unexpectedly at the weekend talked about down there um but again the biggest issue Kieran, is whether these appeals will be held or heard or decided before or after the season finishes because you know, i i presume they won't be held um jointly will they there won't be two separate commissions going well there are two separate commissions obviously but you'd think one will uh, announce before the other but they've they've got to operate in a series system. So, um, from what we understand, the Nottingham Forest hearing is taking place next week. I think it's due to start on the twenty second of April. Um, one would presume that, given it's an appeal, it should take less time to go through all of the details. Given that we've already had one one ruling with regard to it. Um, and then Everton have announced that they're going to appeal. They, they were unhappy with the two points. Um, and then the Premier League have now put out a an announcement to say they are going to do all that they can to ensure that the Everton appeal um, hearing and verdict will be announced before the final match. Although as a backstop, it, it could go as far as the 25th of May which I don't think would be acceptable to anyone unless it, it turns out that you know, yeah, final match yes. Everton are five points ahead of the, of the side, yeah, third bottom, yeah. um, and therefore it's, it's not going to have any impact. Um, so so that's, that's where we are. Forrest's appeal, again, appears to be linked to the uh, 
the legendary Jenon Bronson um, and the, the potential sale of this individual who, who may or may not have been uh, uh, transferred to Spurs uh, a couple of months after the end of the, the financial year end. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's becoming, becoming a bit tedious. And yeah, we've got other clubs who are potentially in the firing line. We've also got the fact that there could be yet, it, it's, it looks like we're going to have yet a third commission in respect of Everton because the last commission says, well, we don't really understand the rules with regards to the interest charges. Um, the Premier League seem quite aggressive towards Everton in, in this particular regard. And it, my view as a, I've not got a dog in the fight. I, I think that's a bit harsh because Spurs were allowed to add their interest costs to the uh, the stadium. Um, yeah, I know on a sort of a on, on a word by word basis, there is there is a possible case, but yeah, in the spirit of the game, it, it does seem to be uh, very harsh. Well, that also raises the prospect of more problems next season because if there is another points deduction for Everton next season, then the three relegated clubs this season are going to be arguing that that should be retrospective and that's kept them out of the Premier League. So it's a shit show, Kieran, and it's not looking as though it's going to finish. I, I do have every sympathy, though, with those people who say that surely the Everton and Forest decision should be announced on the same day. It makes no sense to allow one of them to be able to ad- adapt the, the way they play football to the end of the season because they know they're losing points or they know they've got points back and the other one doesn't have that that opportunity. And also it makes life so much more difficult for Luton Town in particular, who then, I mean, obviously they will try to win every game, but there are, there are games that they might target more than others. So it, it's not fair on, that's three sets of fans on, which is it's not fair, Kieran, isn't it, really? That's right. And yeah, we we go to a game of football at the weekend to escape, you know, to escape the pressures of you know, trying to pay the bills, to escape the pressures of uh, an increasingly uncertain world and so on. And to go into a match not knowing what is a good result. You know, because you might you might go, you know, sometimes I, I remember when when Brighton were, you know, at the bottom of the Premier League, yeah, we were fighting to avoid relegation and so on. And you'd go somewhere such as the Etihad, and say, 2-0 defeat, I'll take that now. Because you were, you're actually thinking ahead, of, you know, you're going as far, you've, you've done all your sums and you're looking at goal difference and um, you know, and fans do do that. And, it, and that is part of the game and that's, that's part of our, our engagement with our individual clubs and so on. And the lack of certainty uh, doesn't reflect well on the way that the rules are being applied. And... It's it's disappointing. The Premier League brand, I mean, lots of people have done quite a few interviews on this, saying, well, will the Premier League brand be impacted? I'll be honest, it won't, because we've got the fans of those individual clubs, they will be individually and collectively angry or or sanguine about the final decision. But as far as the international fan base is concerned, they're not interested in the bottom of the Premier League. It's, it's very much all geared towards Champions League qualification and who's going to win the, the trophy itself. We'll be coming back to the Everton situation in a moment, Kieran, but to be honest, I need a, a couple of sorbets before we get onto that because it really is starting to make my, my head hurt. I'm trying so hard to keep on top of the detail. Um, <laughs> this next story, Kieran, indicates the irony of what we're talking about, though, in that you know, profit sustainability could all be academic this time next season because the Premier League seem desperate to overturn that and find another way of working things out. That's right. Um, there was a, an effectively either a leak or an announcement uh, following the most recent Premier League Chief Executive Stroke Owner meeting, uh, which took place in respect of April, uh, which has indicated that from 25-26, um, we will be moving in alignment with the uh, UEFA's new variant of cost control, the snappily named squad cost control rules. And as far as Premier League clubs are concerned, is that they will be able to spend um, 85% of their revenues plus 
the best, well, it looks as if it will be the best profits from player sales either the last year or the average of the last two years or the average of the last three years. So they will be trying to. <laughs> Either you've got a new phone uh, ringtone or Finley's learnt the piano. <laughs> and that, that's, the, that's the theme tune to the, uh, to the film Halloween uh, done by John Carpenter, which is Halloween's my favourite ever movie. And, and that was uh, a very senior journalist who was trying to get hold of me. I thought I'd switch my phone off beforehand. Oh, right. um, but as, as far as the Premier League is concerned, you say, well, you, you take your, your traditional revenue streams, you add on your player sale profits, and then you can spend 85% of that on your on your player costs. And your player costs are wages, but only the wages of the players. Um, uh, you've then got your amortization costs, you've got any player impairments, any player write downs, and agent fees. So, because ag- agents are the, you know, we've said, you know, they are the pantomime villain of uh, modern football. And I think they get a, yeah, they, they get a harsh press because they're, because they're easy to give a kicking to. Um, so, I put to all of those numbers into a spreadsheet, which I just happened to have by my side when it was announced. Um, yes, and, and the clubs that we would expect to have to spend less money will have to spend less money, and the clubs that have got a lot of money already will be able to spend a lot of money. Um, so there is no major difference in, in terms of the impact, I think, upon individual clubs. I think those clubs who have got a good player trading model you know, the likes of Brentford and Brighton, let's let's be honest, they will be able to spend more money. But I don't think their owners are particularly interested in spending more money because you know, the whole whole point about their model is it's about being successful with a um you know with, with a modest budget. I think those clubs who are going to be most frustrated will be the likes of Newcastle and Villa, where the owners are willing to put in a lot of money to to invest in new talent, i.e., more expensive talent, and therefore, you know, in theory, better talent. Um, and certainly, the reaction I've seen in social media uh, from fans of those clubs is: we want to be disruptors. We want to be the new Chelsea or Manchester City in terms of challenging the established elite. But these rules will not let us do so. And I think that's that's the down point. So. There's going to be very little difference between the, the position in which we presently operate, apart from effectively the amount of money that you can spend will be index linked. Because if your revenue goes up by twelve percent, then you what you can spend on players will go up from twelve percent, and that's what again Everton have argued that they've not been able to spend more money for over a decade because the, the rules were never revised to take into account inflation. Talking of established elites, Kieran, in the Premier League, just briefly, I, I'm fairly certain that Richard Masters, the supreme leader of the Premier League, said um, quite often, some time ago, that the Premier League were going to remain entirely neutral on the idea of an independent regulator. Um, they're not doing a very good job the last few days, are they really? They're, 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 their heads are well above the parapet when it comes to knowing what their opinion is on the football governance bill and the independent regulator. Well, that's right. I think when Richard uh, presented to the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport in, I think it was February, he said, uh, I think I'll quote correctly, it would be pointless to lobby against the regulator. And we take those comments on board. Um, And what we have seen is, first of all, uh, the the Premier League effectively are putting advertisements in Politico, which is sort of the house paper of Westminster. Secondly, uh, yeah, I I travel uh, to and through London on a regular basis, and the Premier League is now sticking up adverts on on the tube trains. So effectively, not explicitly saying we don't want a regulator, but saying things are absolutely great as they are. I'm going, well, hold on, you know, we've got Leicester and Everton and Forest and we've got hacked off Luton fans and we've got a couple of other stories that we're probably going to come to, which doesn't indicate that everything is hunky or indeed dory 
as far as the, <laughs> the Premier League is concerned. So we've got that. And then we've seen a couple of articles um, in the Times newspaper. I've got to be very careful what I say here because I actually got a telling off from the Premier League yesterday. I'm thinking, I think you've probably got better things to do, guys, than, than have a go at some, you know, a teacher. You know, I think, yeah. I think you know, what's happening in terms of clubs. But, you know, I, I take that on board. Um, where there have been sort of op-ed pieces, A, from Richard Masters um, in The Times um, and from other parties as well in The Times saying, ah, regulator, you know, it's, it's uh, unintended consequences is is the line they like to use. I, we, we don't actually know what's wrong with it, but we sort of hint that it's sort of big brother, the establishment, uh, okay, well, you know, you're owned by sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, private equity, and so on. There could be nothing more establishment than those, but you're trying to imply that um, uh, something which is the approval of football fans themselves is uh, is anti. Um, and then the Premier League are also hosting an event um, at uh, Westminster in, in the House of Lords. So it's not directly lobbying MPs because... Uh, you know, House of Lords are elected officials as opposed to members of Parliament, but it's pretty damn close to it. And for reasons which we don't know, the National League who have, have decided to sort of do a, a meerkat impersonation and stick their <laughs> head up and go, oh, we're opposed to the regulators. Oh, okay. Well, hold on. Um, it was only a couple of years ago when you, you were begging for money. Um, and you know, we've we've been, I think, fairly critical of the way that the Prem, that the National League distributed money, um, and anybody who has who has seen the film Gate Money um, will perhaps know our reasons why we've got reservations. Mm. Uh, the, the House of Lords are very much unelected, Kieran, but um, which is why some people don't like them. But at the moment, they are a bastion of sense and sensibility in this madhouse of a country we live in. Uh, I mean, Kieran, you're quite right to use that they're having a go at a teacher argument because that's exactly how it... I'm a teacher, I'm a nurse, you can't have a go at me. Who's having a go at you at the Premier League? Uh, I, I, I put something up on Twitter which I didn't like. I go, oh, well, Who's, I, really? I, I, I'd heard it from a very good source, but they, they're claiming it's not the case, so I've taken it down. Well, listen, there, is, there are well, there are, there are ways of dealing with this, Kieran. One of the things I've... I've met a lot of people through 40 years in comedy, a lot of security people who know people who know people. So if you want to, you know, just pass me, you know, if you want to do the Boris Johnson, just pass me a phone number, Kieran. No, no, it was, it was, it was done, be, very, it was done very politely. Done very politely. There'll be no bruises. There'll be no bruises. Don't worry. This episode of The Price of Football is brought to you by the AI-powered workspace Notion. We are living in an era of information overload and we have more knowledge than ever before. But what do we do with it all? If you're in Notion, you put that knowledge to work. It's a workspace designed not just for making progress, but getting inspired. And all I can say on a personal level is for somebody whose life is quite chaotic and I'm writing pieces for government and newspapers and media content. I've got my university commitments and I'm supposed to be writing a book. I use Notion all the time because it brings order into chaos. Well, if you need order brought to your chaos, you can try Notion for free when you go to notion.com slash price of football. That's all lowercase letters, notion.com slash price of football and start turning your ideas into action. That's notion.com slash price of football. <sighs> The comfort of your favorite seat is now your comfy car-selling command center, thanks to Carvana. It doesn't get any better than this. Your favorite seat's the best spot in the house. Make it even better by entering your license plate or VIN and getting a real offer in minutes. There really is no place like home. And speaking of home, Carvana will pick up your car from yours after you finalize your offer. Visit Carvana.com or download the app and sell your car from your comfy place. We're talking to the sports minister next week, Kieran. We're interviewing the sports minister, so it's going to be very interesting to get his side of the argument and uh, ask him how it feels to be lobbied um, by a, a group that has promised not to do any lobbying. So it's, I, it's it's really interesting. Yeah, we will talk about this in some detail, Kieran, uh, with the sports minister. So let's leave it till then. Uh, he will definitely know people that can 
<laughs> we've seen, Kieran, this week um, some very high-profile protests against ticket prices. Spurs, Man City fans in particular, very unhappy. Um, and rightly so, unhappy with the way Man City have used images of fans um, in their in their adverts for increasing ticket prices. Um, but it seems like the year of frozen season ticket prices is over for good, Kieran. I think it is that there's no doubt that uh, owners, and I'm not, I'm not having a go at American owners here. American owners think that Premier League revenues are understated in terms of what they could be. They are very unhappy with the level of pricing. Um, there was uh, uh, an, an interesting issue uh, in terms of FIFA. Actually, we'll, we'll come back to that as a later story. Um, getting involved as well. But Nottingham Forest have just announced their their prices for next season, um, apparently averaging 24%, which is... And, and admittedly, that is coming from a relatively low base. I'm, I'm not denying that. Um, but there's... It, it will bring in an extra £2 million. Now, to, to put that into some form of context, the difference between finishing 17th and 16th in the Premier League is worth £3.4 million. So here we've got fans being targeted and it's sort of the nature of the way that fans are being targeted. So uh, I think a kid's ticket, a kid's season ticket at, at Forest, and it was fantastic, you know, 90 quid, you know, effectively a fiver. Um, that's That's gone from 90 to 190 pounds. So, you know, it, it's making things more difficult for parents when you know, anybody that's raising kids at present will know that, that costs in general are really challenging. Um, I was talking to somebody from West Ham, um, from from their fan base recently, and this is where things I, I I find they're getting a little bit insidious, in the sense that if you are a West Ham fan and you are a senior citizen, um, and they're putting it up from sixty five to sixty six, by the way, before as to when you become a senior citizen, um, if you want to get the discount for being a senior, you've got a choice of either staying where you are. And you, know, you might have been sitting in that same place. And yeah, there's a, se- there's a separate issue as to the fact it's, it's not a great place to watch football and West Ham fans will cheerfully acknowledge that. Um, if, if you want to carry on sitting with your mates and you are in the lower tiers, um, you've got to go and pay full, full adult price. Or if you want to uh, get the benefit of having a reduction for being a, a senior citizen, you've got to move to tiers five and six. Now we've both been to uh, West Ham as away fans, and I've been up in the gods, and you know it, it is like watching sensible soccer um, for, for people who used to play that particular great computer game, um, and also the fact that it's it's a long way up. You know, you know, Edmund Edmund Hillary would have to go and take a Sherpa to get to to tiers five and six. So you know. We're getting on a bit and having to expect people, you know, and, and people say, well, you're being soft, you know. But at, at, if you've got you've got knackered knees like I have, you know, an extra four or five flights of stairs and you're going to see uh, the match from even further away does seem very harsh. In respect of Spurs, Spurs have put up their prices, I believe, by an average of around about 6%. And what they're telling their seniors is... If you uh, if you're an existing senior citizen, um, we're going to halve the discount that you get. And if you become you know 65, 66, whatever it's going to be, I think from 25, 26, tough. You know, there ain't going to be any reductions going forwards. Why is this? Spurs is a fantastic stadium. Uh, Spurs could sell more tickets to tourists, and that's what they want to do. You know, and, and that's not having a dig at tourists. You know, if, if I go to you know, if I go to Boston or Chicago and I, I want to go and see an NBA game or an NFL game, then then I'm prepared to pay as it's a one off event. I'm prepared to pay more money. Um, and in the states, you know, that's 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 the way that it goes. Spurs have got a huge waiting list, um, as have West Ham. Yeah, I think they've got a waiting list for season tickets. And again, you or I, we we are old enough to remember that in that very first season of the Premier League and also in sort of the five or six years prior to that, 
even if you were in the top division of English football, your ground was a quarter empty because that you know, I remember Manchester United averaging yeah around about thirty eight thousand one season in 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 the eighties, and that was still you know they were the most popular club in the country. I, I can remember going to matches at the Goldstone. Uh, when Brighton were in the top division, when there were less than ten thousand people there, you know, th- things have changed. Football has become gentrified. It's appealing to a broader audience. I absolutely understand that. Those fans who were there at the inception of the Premier League that helped to generate that atmosphere, that helped to make the product a global success. I think the attitude of many clubs is, "Thank you very much. You've served your purpose." Do one. We want people with more money. Mm. Um, both West Ham and Newcastle, I'm sure, Kim, will point out to us that there are lifts up to those upper tiers, and we mm. would point out that they take a bit of finding. Those lifts are not as clearly marked as you'd like to think. Although I have to say, the way my eyesight's going, the further away from the pitch I am at the moment, the better I can see things. I, I, I can't. I haven't got space in my pockets, Kieran. I still like to try and dress in a fairly trendy man but I can't take two pairs of glasses to a football game anymore I haven't got the space so I've reached that stage where I, I either can't read the team news on the phone or I can't watch the game I have to make that value judgment beforehand it's a it's a nightmare those conspiracy theorists Kieran who are constantly asking us why Chelsea are not being um, scrutinized more for the um, profit and sustainability will love this story because it will feed into their conspiracy theories. It's a sort of bizarre game of Monopoly going on at Stamford Bridge, which um, to people who are looking for things to beat Chelsea with, this is one of those sticks that they happily pick up. I realise I've mixed about 18 metaphors in that sentence there, Kieran, but I found myself on a roll and didn't know where to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it does It does seem like Monopoly because it, it involves hotels, yeah, to, yeah. to put it mildly. So... Um, Chelsea's results came out. Now, I, I I left home on Saturday morning to go to Burnley at about <laughs> half five in the morning. Yeah, which came as, a, it came as a surprise to the Baroness, I understand. <laughs> yes, it did. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned it at Christmas. That I, yeah, I'll be going to Burnley. Um, <laughs> and for some reason... You, did, you didn't tell me it was Christmas when you told me you definitely told her. You implied yeah. that you definitely told her two days before, not Christmas, in passing on Boxing Day, eight you o'clock what at match night. Are you going to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so it came as a somewhat confused Where was he gone? Um, so, so Chelsea's results came out at uh, ten past six on Saturday morning. Uh, so I'm I'm on a train. I'm on a train from Haywards Heath to Stevenage. So I, I put them in. I actually brought my spreadsheet with me because just just in case, Kevin, you always got to have a just in case spreadsheet with you. When you're oh, of course you have, yeah. Um, and Chelsea had lost two hundred and forty nine million pounds, a quarter of a billion pounds in terms of the day to day running of the club. And you're going, well, that's gonna that's gonna really kick the doors in as far as financial fair play limits, which we've been now one hundred and five million over three years. Um, and and you look at some of those numbers and they're just crazy. You know, their amortization charge. And this is when they were still using their creative amortization charge. Two two over two hundred million quid. Now that's that's fifty million pounds more than Manchester City. It's sixty or seventy million pounds more than Manchester United and Liverpool and so on. Um so it's that that's the highest ever in Premier League history. Their wage bill. Four hundred and three million pounds. Uh, you know, paying an average, I think, about one hundred and sixty-five, one hundred and seventy grand a week for finishing twelfth in the Premier League. Um, that's the second highest wage bill in the history of the Premier League. They all say, "Well, Manchester City, theirs was higher last season." But you go, "Well, hold on, Manchester City won the Premier League. They won the FA Cup. They won the Champions League. They, they've got big bonuses to pay out, and they've got all of the additional money coming in from winning those tournaments." Um, so you then say, well, okay, how, how have they managed to get those losses down? And they managed to get those losses down. Um, yes, they sold some players, fair dues. Then we sort of get into the realms of you know, 4D chess. Um, there were some legal charges 
in relation to the takeover, 17 million quid, which Chelsea Football Club have charged to another part of the Chelsea group, the Bow Lake uh, uh, Empire. No, top, so Bowley Empire, Clear Lake and Bowley Empire. Now, well, why didn't you do that last year when you'd taken over the club? So that seems a bit of change. They, they're showing £12 million coming in, and it just says settlement. Well, what do you mean? You know, is this, is this something to do with property? Is, is, this, a, is this winning a legal case? Um, no detail is given whatsoever. Um, and then we come to the issue of property sales. Chelsea sold two hotels and they made a £76 million profit. And presumably, this meant that they, as a result of those property sales, they just so happened to be under the financial fair play limits because they've not been charged by the Premier League and they will have had to have submitted their accounts to the Premier League by the 31st of December and the Premier League had two weeks to make a decision. So this was a hotel sale to themselves on which they booked a profit. So you know, if folks, anybody listen, to, yeah, if I go and sell, if I go and sell the house to the Baroness uh, for a hundred grand more than I paid for it, does that, does that mean I'm a hundred grand richer? Because we were living it in beforehand, and we're still living it in today, and we've got a joint bank account. You know, it's can you see how how unusual this looks. And it then appears, as well as selling the hotels at a profit, um, Chelsea are running the hotels because they've now got a management agreement and they'll be keeping all of the profits from those hotels. This is a sale to what we refer to as a related party. And under the Premier League rules, all transactions with related parties have to be approved within 10 days of the Premier League being informed. Well, given that this sale must have taken place before the 30th of June 2023, why has the Premier League not approved this? Because when you take a look at the small print of the accounts, it says, yeah, we made a £76 million profit, but the Premier League might take an alternate view. Well, OK, well, the Premier League's now at nine months, 10 months to make that decision. It's supposed to do it in 10 days. So it, it all looks weird. And then I'm looking at that wage bill and I'm going, well, that, that wage bill can't be right. But then I'm thinking, well, well, hold on. We've got redundancy payments to Thomas Tuchel, you know, the, the, the manager who, who helped Chelsea to win the, the Champions League in, in 2021. His name is not even mentioned in the account. It's not even a yeah, thank you for your services, nothing. There's going to be a payoff to Graham Potter. Now, Chelsea's quite happy to show, oh, aren't we clever? We've got this extra money coming into the club from the settlement, from the, the hotel sales. So they're, sort of, they're patting themselves on the back, but they're not being honest. I think they're being very disingenuous. And I've got to say I'm really disappointed in the auditors here because if you look at Chelsea's accounts historically, they have always said, this has been the cost of changing the managers. We saw Everton's accounts. We spent two and a half million pound payoff to the chief executive, a seven million pound payoff to Frank Lampard. Why are Chelsea not being transparent with people? How much does it cost them for that settlement with Tuchel? How much did they go and pay to Brighton? Now, we happen to know from Brighton's accounts, it was 23 million quid. How much was Graham Potter's settlement? This is, this is poor, poor level of uh, detail from a flagship football club. So... Where we are at present, they appear to be within the rules, but the Premier League's not made a decision. If that £76 million hotel settlement isn't allowed, and under the Premier League rules, you, you are allowed to include it, but they then have to go and do their own calculation as to what the appropriate profit would be. I don't think it reflects particularly well on the Premier League because under the EFL rules, if you sell something to yourself, which is a piece of property, that's excluded from FFP. It's broadly excluded from UEFA as well. The Premier League have chosen, or rather Premier League club's owners have chosen to allow this type of creative accounting within their system. And at the same time, they're saying, we're absolutely brilliant at everything we do. We don't want a regulator. Mm. 
I suppose this is the moment, Kieran, where producer Guy would want us to say, when you say the hotel sale is an unusual transaction, it's not an illegal one. No, no, per- perfectly legal. Yep, yep, yep. yep. But for FFP purposes, it's 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 got to be effectively approved by the Premier League, and they have failed to do so in in nine months since the year end. And I think that's uh, that's the disappointing thing. It, yeah. it could be perfectly acceptable for all we know. Yeah, I, I was talking to two Chelsea fans the other day, Kieran, because I'm I'm a big man. I'm mature. I'll I'll talk to all sorts of people, basically. But it's really interesting because they, they're both 100% both sensible people who've been supporting Chelsea for a long time. One of them knows people within the club. They're both convinced that Conor Gallagher will have to be sold in the summer purely because he'll go for 40, 50 million. And that'll be all profit because he's one of the academy players. So you, you almost feel so. I'm not going to say I feel sorry for Chelsea fans because that would be a lie. But you almost do feel sorry for fans when... As you've said so many times, we're we're increasingly not talking about the football. We're talking about the finances behind it, which could be our fault. Um, those many fans, Kieran, that have complained over the years about the EFL streaming service um, will be complaining no longer. That's right. Um, the iFollow deal, and I think it's fair to say it did have teething problems, but it improved significantly. You know, they, they got their act together. Um, for people not familiar with iFollow, it was effectively um, allowing the fans to watch their team, um, you know, mainly overseas, uh, but also for, I think for midweek matches uh, when they were away from home, you could you could pay ten pounds for a pass. Uh, that has ceased to be, and I think the biggest losers here will be Wrexham because Wrexham have built up such a huge following in the United States. Um, they were making a lot of money on the back of that. But it is being replaced with the new TV deal in which every uh, every match apart from the 3pm blackouts is now going to be made available uh, due to the new deal that uh, the EFL have with Sky. So there will be winners and losers. You've got some clubs that have got huge away followings who, who can't get tickets and therefore would tend to buy iFollow passes. Um, the the value of the the EFL TV deal has gone up and it's also gone up internationally as well, um, but uh, I think there will be some clubs who would have preferred I follow had remained and there'll be some f- clubs who was, felt it was too much hassle than it was worth and you know, they didn't tend tend to sell very many passes because of the uh, you know the, the numbers and and the sort of the culture of their fan base. I'm not pretending, Kieran, that I'm putting off the Everton story because it's going to be a struggle. I've just noticed on my, I've just written on my notes, Stevenage to Burnley, which reminds me, I was going to ask you, where, I, I know you like a bargain, Kieran, when it comes to rail travel, but uh, Haywards Heath to Stevenage, I get, but then what's the next leg of the journey from Stevenage to Burnley? It's Stevenage to Leeds and then Leeds to uh, Burnley, Manchester Road. So it, it is the, it is probably the best journey. It means you don't have to, change and go through you know hop hop on a tube at london and be told how great the premier league is um <laughs> when you when you get on your tube train this 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 is this is this is me taking it up against the man you see <laughs> well well can, while you're taking it up against the man perhaps you can read those premier league posters on the tube while you're going to the royal garden party <laughs> mr sticking it to the man It's not just the sound of that first sip of Morning Joe. It's the sound of someone shopping for a car on Carvana from the comfort of home. That's a good blend. It's time to take it easy, like answering some easy questions to get pre-qualified for a car in minutes. Talk about starting the morning right. Just like customizing your terms so your car fits your budget. Mm -mm -mm. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to experience car shopping the way it should be. Convenient. Comfortable. Ah. It's only a kick, a jump, a block, it's only a serve, it's only a tackle, a run, it's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Um, now, Everton, Kieran, you, you, you will have to speak slowly to me. I'm, I'm going to break this down into two chunks. 
And first of all, there is news that Everton have paid £30 million in interest charges. Now, this is Everton, not 777. Everton have paid £30 million in interest charges to we're not entirely sure who. Um, well, no, we we are broadly sure who. It's to a company called Rights and Media Funding Limited. And when you download the accounts for Rights and Media Funding, this is where the eyebrows start to creep up a wee bit. Um, Rights and Media Funding has, has lent, I think it's around about £200 million or more, to Everton Football Club. You say, well, okay, that's, that's, that's a lot of money. You'd expect them to have, you know, be a quite a big organisation if they've not heard of them. Um, they, they've got no employees. So no. I, I don't know whether it's done by AI. I don't know how it's done. <laughs> um, and then you go, where's rights and media funding based? And it's sort of a, you know, a, a pop-up uh, registered office in, in uh, I think it's in Altrincham in Cheshire. Uh, and there are quite a few companies that, that uh, are based in, in this particular pop-up. Then you say, well, they must be getting the money from somewhere themselves. And, and you go, oh, the Bahamas, uh, Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, Cyprus. I'm not saying these places are opaque tax havens, Kevin, because that would be a cynical thing to do. And, and as we both know, I'm not a cynical person. But um, it it does seem that rights and media funding are being u- utilizing the the offshore markets to raise money and then on the back of that they've lent it to everton and they're they're lending at you know pretty steep rates i think it's 5% above base rate and and given the level of risk with everton i don't think that's an except you know i don't think that's an excessive interest rate but at the same time it's uh it's it's a bit weird, and then the guy behind um, uh, rights and media funding, I think he's a guy called Michael Tabor. He's been a successful entrepreneur in the gambling industry. He's had stakes in sort of online gambling companies and so on, um, and he's done very well for himself. There's no doubt about it, and I think he's doing particularly well out of this deal. Um, so th- I think this is sort of an investigation by the Guardian. I think it's Simon Good- Goodley at the Guardian, and he's tried to get answers out of both the club and rights and media funding has made little progress and it's this this lack of transparency it's this lack of people being willing to be proactive which makes you feel slightly uneasy given the predicament that we know that Everton in are in on a on a much broader basis at present uh, we'll, we'll come back to their wider predicament in a moment which is a, never a, something a fan wants to hear you talk about the, those interest rates seeming realistic, but to, given the amount of the loan, you said they were taken out £30 million in interest. Seems an awful lot of interest, Kieran. Well, it, it, it is. And now whether that's being added on to the capital um, of the value of the loan or whether the interest is being physically paid, um, I'm not in a position to, to comment one way or the, or the other. Um, but I think on a much broader issue... If Everton were in as good a financial position as Farhad Mashiri has often claimed them to be, why are you going to the lights of rights and media funding? Yeah, you know, why aren't you going to a uh, you know, a more well known lending establishment who who would do a you know, a much broader risk assessment? You know, could it be that the traditional lenders aren't willing to to, to give money? to the club under these circumstances and therefore it's had to go to I think, you know, MSP Capital and and others and Andy Bell who's, who's a big Everton fan and he's, you know, he, he wants the club to, to thrive and survive and you can understand he's been very successful in, it, in his own right with regards to that um, but when you start to go to non-prime lenders you, you do feel slightly uncomfortable as, as an outside observer Well, that leads us nicely into the second part of this week's Everton story. Um, 777 partners have been given more time to complete their takeover of Everton, but the bit that's been giving me a concentration headache, Kieran, and I can't seem to find out in any of the reports or any of the uh, media 
one of the issues is the repayment of a loan. I think if it's one hundred and thirty million pounds, but I can't for the life of me work out whether that's money that Everton owes to seven seven seven, or vice versa, or why Mashiri has said that he will personally cover it if he has to. That's the one detail, and and I don't know if they're not reporting it because they don't know, but it seems that people were happy to just record it without explaining what's going on there. Yeah, th- this is in fact a, a loan from a US lender called MSP Capital. It was due to be repaid uh, earlier this week. So this is, this is a loan to 777 or a loan to so Everton? This is a loan to Everton. Right. Which was, so this was a loan which was arranged by Mashiri, in effect, um, by this company called MSP Sports Capital. And it was due for repayment or what could have happened was that 777 could have borrowed money themselves, which they would have then paid to MSP Sports Capital. But it looks as if 777 have not been able to do that to date. So that that loan potentially was uh, due to be repaid. And if the, if repayment had not taken place, MSP could have acquired some of Everton you know, as, as a penalty. Or the um, grounds. That well, yeah, I think shares shares in the club and, and right. you know, right. other assets and so on. So it, it now appears that seven 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 are going ah, nothing to worry about. We, we just need a little bit more time. Now I I go back to when I was sort of seven years old and uh, assisting uh, my my, you know, my my sadly departed uncle Terry when he was collecting money from people to whom it was owed. Um, and if they said, uh, all is fine, we just need a bit more time, yeah, yeah, that yeah. didn't tend to go down particularly well. Um, so it, it does look as if um, there's been a sort of a short-term kick down the road. And, it, and I think, you know, reading the article here in, in, the, in the I newspaper, they're saying that they think it's now going to be pushed back to the 19th of May. But when you were talking, you know, more than a hundred million pounds on a, on a, effectively on a month, month loan basis, that's not clever. Um, and where are we in terms of 777? Uh, they, they disappear um, when it suits them and they don't answer the phone calls from, it would appear to be anybody that's, uh, who's got the, the greater interests of the club at heart. Um, so it's it's a, it's a godforsaken mess. Forgive me, Kieran, for being a bearer of small brain when it comes to this. The, the bit I can't get my head around entirely is that Mashiri took the loan out. The money well, was lent to Mashiri. Yeah, he, all, he, oh, so, he, so he Everton, arranged it. Yeah. So so the loan was given to Everton. Yeah. So why then are seven 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 having to pay it back as a condition of the? Because it was due for repayment earlier this week, right? So but they, but, but they MS, seven 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 don't own, own Everton though. So why is Mashiri not having to repay this? Rather than this is a bit I can't grasp. Yeah. Well, Mashiri's gone to ground. You know, right. he's Now you know there have been a number of comments as to where's Mashiri getting his money from in the first right. place. You know, right. Uh, you know, and, and everybody knows that he had a historic close relationship with Alicia Usmanov. The, uh, the the Russian oligarch who is effectively persona non grata, they they work together. Um, Mashiri was able to buy Everton by selling his shares in Arsenal to Usmanov, and from the proceeds he then bought into Everton. Um, you know, there, there have been a series of comments with regards to the links between those two individuals. Usmanov is no longer allowed in this country. He appears to have. You know, severed his links with the club and also to be fair the club has severed its links with him Mashiri's cash balance seems to have disappeared you know in in theory you know the the best thing to do Mashiri pays back the loan on behalf of the football club and uh, he sorts it out with 777 when he when he sells the club to them but he doesn't appear to be in a position to do that right and and just briefly to end this story Kieran because we it's already been quite a long pod and we do have other stories to to cover, there was a very interesting article in the Athletic uh, 
two days ago, I believe, which said for the first time that one of the options for Everton uh, has now to be administration, that that's got to be included on the possible outcomes of this terrible protracted saga. Would you agree with that? Um, if the, if 777 acquisition of Everton does not take place, then administration becomes a greater possibility. Um, certainly, in terms of whoever buys Everton is acquiring a club that, that owes the thick end of you know, four to five hundred million pounds, still has to pay for the completion of the stadium. There's an argument for saying the club's not worth paying paying that particular price. Um, and therefore, if the club goes into Everton, if the club goes into administration, yes, there will be a points deduction, but that won't probably kick in to the end, you know, till, till next season. So that's somebody else's issue. If I can save myself a few hundred million pounds as part of the purchase price, I might, as a as a, an alternative investor to seven 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 take the view that that's a price worth paying. Because when you buy a company out of administration, you only buy the assets and you don't take over the existing debts. Right. Here's a story, Kieran, that's almost as old as the podcast. We've been dealing with it from the start. Um, and it concerns Leeds United and Jean-Kevin Augustin. Uh, the reason I say that is because when we first started talking about it, I used to pronounce it Jean-Kevin Augustin, uh, until a French friend of mine went, no, no, it's Kevin in French. It's, it's, you, know, you, got, you got the first one and the third one. So Jean-Kevin Augustin. Um, it's a long-running story, Kieran. Um, it seems to be resolved. Yes, uh, and I'll, I'll summarise this briefly because, I say, it's been a very long podcast to date. Um, Leeds signed uh, JKA on loan um, from a French club <laughs> with a... An, uh, an obligation to buy should Leeds be promoted by the by the end of the season. Um, it, it's fair to say that he didn't appear to be as good as people thought he was. Um, Leeds were promoted. Leeds then argued that because they were because this was the COVID season, the season officially ends by the thirtieth of June because that's your financial year end. The matches didn't finish being played until July. So therefore, that obligation to buy him didn't kick in. Cass said we disagree with that. FIFA had said the seasons were being extended. So there was a twenty. There was a you know, the, uh, a twenty odd million pound fee to pay in respect of the player, and then the player himself, who was returned, I think it was to RB Leipzig, um, said, "Well, hold on. Given that I should have had a four year contract, and that was on around about a hundred grand a week, um, should you be promoted?" I want compensating as well. Uh, so I want my contract being paid up. And Leeds said initially, go, go go down your own end of the street, go boil your brains. And they've now, upon sort of uh, quite a few uh, stroppy letters from lawyers, said, we're going to have to pay you up. Now, JKA paid played, I think it was 43 minutes for Leeds United in his career. Um, so therefore, this is a, a world record. It worked out in total in terms of both the transfer fee and his wages. Um, he cost them £823,000 a minute in <laughs> wow. terms of his career at the club. Yeah, wow. An amazing sum of money. Um, and you, you can understand why the club was trying to resist this. You know, you, I'm sure we'd do under the same circumstances. Relationship didn't work out. Great case for saying check your small print. Mm. Two stories to go, Kieran, and the penultimate one is: um, uh, if if I was an emoji, I would be straight face emoji here, uh, or I'd be move along. There's nothing to see emoji here, because um, <laughs> football index may be no longer. But for those people who are missing football index, th- th- this could be good news, Kieran. It could be, yes. If you were one of those people who lost between you an estimated £90 million from yeah. Football Index, which was the, the stock exchange for footballers, you've got the opportunity to, to get all of your money back 
or to double your losses or treble your losses because we have the arrival of a new platform called Kix, spelt K-I-X. No. And um, this looks very, very similar to Football Index. And it turns out that Football Index's co-founder, Adam Cole, is an investor in this. Uh-huh. Um, and Kevin, you know, we, we, we've been watching football for a very long time. But my football supporting career has has been missing digital athlete tokens <laughs> where I can get rewarded for the performances of football players on the pitch. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to be rewarded, and I suspect other people are probably going to be rewarded more than I am. Um, so this is um, the opportunity to buy NFTs. And look, it, I've, I've said all along, if that's what you want to do, if you want to buy the equivalent of a digital Panini card, fill your boots. Yeah, have fun with it. It's not an investment. Now, that's the key thing. And when we when we look at what happened with Football Index, I think the average losses were estimated at around about three thousand pounds, and that average for some individuals was they they would have loved to have just lost three thousand pounds. So the co-founder who, you know, a guy called Adam Cole, who said he was devastated, devastated that all of these people lost their money, is seen to be backing a very, very similar idea. Now, he's not on the board of directors. He's merely an investor in this new organization. Um, I would say to anybody who is thinking of doing it, it's a very, very high risk product. Um, when... I uh, presented to uh, a, a committee of MPs for the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Um, I was asked whether the likes of Football Index was a Ponzi scheme. And I will repeat the answer I gave to the MP that gave me that question. It appears to have many of the characteristics of a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> in the sense that it relies on new people being found. it's uh, th- There's no underlying product or service being offered. And the opportunity to lose 100% of what you've put into the scheme is quite high. Extracting money at a later point from your uh, purchase of the product can prove to be quite difficult. That's not the same as saying it is a Ponzi scheme. Legally, no, it's not quite the same. You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when you're at the Royal Garden Party, Kieran, if if you if you meet, for example, Prince Edward, who I'm told is a very nice chap, oh, very uh, good. Would you would you ask just just for me, just while while he's chatting to the Baroness, just say just have a look at your phone and just say to him, "Whoa, have you seen the price of digital athlete tokens?" Just to see. <laughs> Because I'd, I'd like to, I just like the notion of Prince Edward going, tell me about it. I know I just lost, I had to tell Sophie how much I lost. Our last question, our last question, our last news story, Kieran, takes us to the the very hub of the the, the crypto world um, and Rail Bedford. We, we've got an interview tomorrow, Kieran, with Chris Ewing uh, of Caledonian Braves, a catch up interview, who's telling us about his not quite as unusual as he used to be funding model. Uh, but Rail Bedford, who we've been in, uh, talking to their owner right from the start, have had a huge investment this week, Kieran. Not only a huge investment, a huge investment from the legendary Winklevoss twins, mm. who, for people not familiar with the, the, the Winklevoss twins, um, they are the people who claimed that Mark Zuckerberg stole Facebook's sort of IP from them. Um, and they they did get a, a settlement at the time. Um, they went on to be um, crypto billionaires. They, they got into Bitcoin at, at the right time. And you know, if, if you had bought Bitcoin 15 years ago, you would be sitting on a, on a huge profit now. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think it's also fair to say that their careers have been associated with with downsides as well as upsides i think they've had to go and have a a one billion pound payoff with regards to another one of their their products and services so they are they are controversial um 
uh, investors, but they've put around about £3.5 million in, I presume, in crypto, uh, in Bitcoin, into uh, Royal Bedford, which is, is run by Peter McCormick. So we have had him, Peter, on the show, and he's, uh, he's very evangelical um, about what he feels can be achieved um, through the use of, of Bitcoin and you know, other views are are available, but Bitcoin <laughs> is 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 the. I think it's fair to say it is the senior cryptocurrency, uh, yeah. you know, and many others have failed, and, and it has not. Um, so, what the club's going to do with that investment, uh, we we await to see. Um, I think he had to take some time explaining uh, to the Vinkelboss twins how promotion works because they come from uh, a US sports franchise background where you you pay a franchise fee um, and that they are unfamiliar with the concepts of of promotion relegation yeah and, and peter has said it, it's it's his, his ambition to get uh real bedford uh into uh, senior football uh in, in the form of the efl and the premier league we we wait to see what happens i mean i think they, they were promoted last season and congratulations to them for that mm. uh, and before any of our listeners accuse me of being childish Kieran, I was not chuckling at the name Winklevoss. I was chuckling at your face when you said the name Winklevoss, <laughs> which was childish, Kieran. The look- <laughs> Thank you to everyone who's donated to the pod via our Patreon page. <laughs> if you'd like to make a small monthly contribution to the pod as well, that'd be very kind of you and get you access to our chat community and our regular quizzes. Our end of season quizzes is coming up. I'm not as desperate for the season to end as I was this time last week, Kieran, but you can do all that <laughs> by going to patreon.com slash price of football. If you have a question you'd like answered on the show, email us at questions at price of com, and you can go to the same website to get our book or a price of football t-shirt. We'll be back on Monday with a questions uh, episode. In the meantime, I shall hand you over to Mr. Kieran Maguire for his customary farewell. Well, thank you always to uh, people that, uh, that engage with us uh, via. If you're on Patreon, we've got a little Discord community, which is mm. you know, we, we we discuss the things which I can't say on the show at times. Um, <laughs> but if there's any lawyers watching, it's, it's not me that's making those comments. Um, there's there's a variety of ways in which you you can support the show, and one of those is to go onto your app and and to give the show a review. It, it keeps us in the charts. Uh, we are. We are we are continually baffled as to to why we're in the charts, but we're going to take it. Um, and by all means, it doesn't matter what you say. So you could even say you would rather have the show presented by Freddie Parrot Face Davis and John Parrot, and I think that would be quite an interesting conversation. Oh, and, and, oh Kieran, the annoying thing is I can't. I can't explain to the listeners why Freddie Parrotface Davis is on our list of possible names. Hence, uh, just in case he's listening, not the, the original. Bye, everybody. Bye. The price of football. Some football.